Hello everyone and welcome to Basket News Talks. I'm the host Donatos Rubones and I'm glad to present our guest uh, Will Thomas. Hello uh, thank, Will. Thank you for having me. Actually we are guests here because we are visiting in Monaco and it's a new team uh, of uh, Will Thomas and I have to say Will that I feel bad having you before the practice because I was told that you always first before the practice and it seems like we are taking your time actually. But I saw that you were all sweaty, so you've already did some work before the practice, right? Yes, uh, do that every day is uh, is a part of my routine to uh, stay in shape, uh, get better every day. That's what, just what I do. And that that's the thing which everyone to told me. Uh, I did the research before the interview. I asked, you know, who Will Thomas is all about. And the first thing they mentioned was like, he's a true pro. Uh, he's always first in the practice. He uh, puts a lot of attention on recovery and stuff like that. So who set an example for you of, you know, being a true professional to prepare for the practice, uh, to, to, you know, to put a lot of attention for recovery and stuff? Uh, I don't think it was just uh, one person. Um, I know I've watched a lot of different podcasts and uh, interviews over the years that like all the great players, they have a routine. They come in early, they they uh, stay after practice and uh, work on their craft to, to get better and be the best player they can be. So it's the thing which you actually learned throughout your years in Europe, right? Because we didn't have podcasts like in 2006 and something like that, right? Right. I, I was still in college at that point. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I just learned over the years. I mean, as you get older, you got to you got to really take care of yourself if you want to if you want a long uh, career. And uh, eating right, um, the different recoveries, just everything. You just got to learn year from year to uh, learn how to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. So who were these players you followed uh, the most, who you were listening to? Uh, I think I watched one podcast with, uh, with uh, Coach K from Duke. Mm -hmm. And he talked about how LeBron and Kobe and them, when he was with the uh, U.S. national team, how they had like he was trying to set everything up for for them to practice and everything and then they came back to him and it's like no we have our own routine how we want to do sh get our shots up uh weightlifting and everything we'll, st we'll still go hard and practice but we don't need you for that we we do that on our own and uh i mean i already started before i heard that but just hearing that i was like oh, okay I'm, i must be doing the right thing can you uh, can you describe your uh, pregame routines right now? Can you compare, uh, for example, right now and coming back to these years in Liege and Ostend in, in Bel Belgium, in general? Oh, like uh, early in my career, I didn't have a routine. Uh, it was basically just show up to practice, probably like 20, 30 minutes before practice, change and just go out there and start warming up with the team. And uh, after practice, just leave and go home. Um, Why are you there doing like this? I mean, I didn't know. Uh -huh. Because on teams like that, you don't really have uh, older players. Is I mean, you have guys that's in probably like their fifth, sixth year, but they they still trying to figure it out too. You don't have 13, 14 year vets that can teach you how to uh, become a true professional. So when I, um, in those days, that's how I did it. And Obviously, because I was younger, I could recover quicker. I didn't need, uh, well, I don't think like Norma Tech and Game Ready. Well, Game Ready was, it was, uh, in existence because I know we had it in college, but, uh, teams like that, they don't have the budget to buy the recovery machines or the, the medical staff to help the players recover quick. So, I mean, I did it on my own just naturally. And then as, uh, I started moving up in Europe to different levels. You start to see the the difference in the clubs and how they uh, help players recover, the different things they do to help the players um, be the best players they can be. Do you remember any examples in your teams? Like you had some teammates which had some specific routines and you were like thinking, oh, this guy is doing something interesting. Maybe I, I should do that uh, too. Hmm. Not, not really. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, not really. No, none mm -hmm. of the players I played with, uh, I guess, um, 
when uh, this was started, like when I was around uh, in Valencia, maybe my first or second year, uh, I just felt like I I needed to do more to because I wasn't a focal point on the offense. But when I, I I just thought when I got my shot to show what I can do, I need to be ready. And that's when I started every day after practice, start uh, working on different low post moves and uh, the three point shot to to improve it. So when I do have that that opportunity, I'm ready. And can you tell that difference, especially for the, all these young people who maybe like you will be listening to this podcast, you know, looking for some inspiration? Can you compare? The, uh, can you tell me the de- describe the difference of being ready with the routine, pre-game routine, pre-practice routine, and like as you said, you know, coming 20 minutes before the practice? Yeah, you feel you feel the difference because you you start making shots. You start making shots that you don't. I guess you don't typically make all the time you start making them more and you you build more confidence and then even the coaches when they see you putting in the extra work they they uh they try they put their trust in you and then you can take off from there and you know what is interesting you're ta- telling me all these stories about valencia how did you put more effort you know to prepare yourself uh, to develop uh, yourself as a player to bring you know to involve that uh, mid-range shot uh, let's say long range uh, shot to your game and i was uh, following your career you can see teams you've played for and for me you and for example kronoslav simon from fs are these two examples of players who were let's say recognized in the Euroleague late in their careers like in early 30s uh, for example okay would you yeah. say that you know that kind of you know your approach on uh, on practice regime and stuff like that made that difference that you actually like you know like a great wine you started to be even better with some years yeah I think I, uh, I age with uh, <laughs> I get better with age yeah um, my game has never been really uh, predicated on athleticism has always been more skill. So uh, as I get more experience and, and learn even more about the the different leagues, the different players over here, I think I, I improve. What do you think about all these guys who has kind of the, the same story like you, you know, like Kronoslav Simon, maybe you also have some players, you know, you are also very fascinated about or something like that? I think it's great. I mean, for Americans, I think it's It's really great if you can make it into over 10 years in Europe mm-hmm. because it's it's very difficult to to survive over here. It's just not um, it's not all about basketball because you have to adjust to the different cultures. You have to uh, really learn a city, um, and it takes time to get comfortable to where you um, where it is just basketball and. When a player can last as long as I've have as an American, it's is a great story. And what were the biggest adjustments you had to make, especially in Belgium? Because for me, like now we all know you in Europe as a very solid veteran player who played uh, lastly, you know, in Zenit and in Valencia and Unicach and stuff like that. But not not many people know that you spent three years in Belgium, then you went to Georgia, and it wasn't, you know, ideal. Uh, start uh, of your career in Europe, uh, let's say. It's not like somebody might uh, think that just like you can play two years for, let's say, you know, average European teams and then you can go to the Euroleague. No, your your path required a lot of patience. What do you remember about all these adjustments you had to do and you had to make in Belgium, for example? Uh, with Belgium, is it was my first experience and uh, I didn't know what to expect and I didn't have... I didn't have uh, anybody like older players that I knew from college that could really give me a lot of information on how Europe is, is, is very different. And the way everyone lives, you go into a country where they don't really speak English. Um, it's just learning how to drive a stick. Um, I guess just fending for myself because I, I had to grow up really quick. And, you know, uh, coming from the States, I, I was very close to home. I always had my mother, uh, my parent, my father, my sisters taking care of me. And then when I came to Europe, I came by myself and I had really, I really didn't know what to expect. And then I had to grow up very fast. 
Do you remember, let's say, the most memorable, you know, growing experiences? I remember I talked with Kenan Potter and he told that for him, the different sockets here in Europe was al already some kind of, you know, something like a shocking thing or like uh, some issues with mobile phones uh, and stuff like mm -hmm. that. What do you remember the most about all these oh, first back, experiences? Yeah, back then it was um, my first year I didn't even have a uh, Wi-Fi. I had to, I had to put the, uh, Ethernet cord into the, into the side of the computer. And I had like a, a cord that was like maybe like 20 meters. So it went from the living room all the way into my bedroom and stuff. And, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, sockets to the power outlets and stuff. That was, I didn't know what to do with that. Uh, I had to ask a few of the older players on the team what to, what to get the, the adapters and things like that. It was, it was difficult the first few uh, weeks, months. Tell me what was the most interesting things, uh, things you experienced in Georgia, because Georgia, Georgia already sounds, uh, let's say, very exotic, especially in, in basketball world, even in Europe. It was different. It was uh, going from America to Belgium. I got used, I got comfortable in Belgium for three years and then going all the way to the other side of Europe where it was, yeah, it was, it was just different. <laughs> the food, the, the people, everything is not, it's not a big basketball country where, where they support basketball or they have, uh, they have some good players like they play for the national team and things like that. But as a whole is, it's not, it's not the greatest league to play in or anything like that. It's, it was just one of the stops in my, in my long career. That experience, it was a strange move, you know, looking from a side, but it helped you to get the Georgian uh, mm -hmm. citizenship, which helped you later, especially going to the leagues like uh, Spain because of the uh, foreigners rules and stuff like that. Uh, but before, you know, making that decision to, you know, accept, to get the passport and stuff like that, did you have any concerns? Like, wasn't it weird for you, you know, to let's say, to, to request that citizenship and stuff like that and the consequences which might, you know, come I mean, with it? The, the team offered the citizenship as a part of the uh, as a part of the deal. Yeah. And then, I mean, that was that was basically the deal. That's the reason I went, yeah. because if you get European citizenship, it, it opens up a lot of more doors for you. And when I I mean, I got there. I went off the decision because I was, I didn't have any kids. I didn't have yeah. many bills. I had no wife or anything. So I was only thinking about myself. And I was like, I can, I can do it by myself for a few months, for eight, nine months. And then it'll be, I have the citizenship and then I can take off from there. Did he ask you, did he ask you to play for the national team? No, they never asked me. Mm -hmm. The, the next thing, we, we, we talked about your uh, preparation routines and stuff. The next thing uh, why we, uh, let's say, admire your game here in Europe is the way you, how you read the game, is the way you, how you adjust in European basketball. And is it possible to learn, let's say, to, to build your basketball IQ? Who taught you the way you play at the moment, the, the way you played throughout your career? Or it was also, you know, going through your uh, experience? Yeah, it's just my experiences from when I was younger. Uh, when I started playing high school basketball, my high school coach really taught me different, um, different aspects of the game to, to help the team win. Uh, it's not all about scoring. It's, you gotta play defense. You gotta share the ball. You gotta encourage your teammates. Um, just helping teams win, helping the team win. People will remember you as a winner more than anything else or a champion. That's, I think that was my goal. Every, every game, every season is try to, try to win as many games as possible and, and win the championship. Who were the smartest players you played with, the smartest coaches you played for, or let's say the smartest coaches you even played against? I don't know especially in coaches. Europe, you know, it's so different. The basketball here is so different. Every like, especially in the EuroLeague, uh, all these countries have have their own basketball. The way Style. they play, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm like all. The, it seemed like a lot of the teams use the same strategy against me. 
So, and what like is it? D- double team. <laughs> double <laughs> That's team. A good strategy. Did, yeah, double team from the baseline. <laughs> of, I think I've seen every double team. I, <laughs> every double team you can possibly do. So, I mean, they they tried, but most of them don't work. <laughs> it depends on who the players are. Which defensive, you know, presence uh, is the biggest challenge uh, for you? Is there any team, any coach you kind of, you know, you enter the court and you you know that, okay, that's going to be a really tough night for you? No. No, there's, uh, most of the teams, is, if you can't guard me one-on-one, then it's, you're going to have a problem. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have your, your defense always uh, rotating, which puts you at a disadvantage. In one of your interviews, you mentioned that Unicaja Malaga experience. Uh, in that team, let's say you learned how to play. Uh, you learned something special. It seemed like you learned something which, uh, let's say, upgraded your game. Can you be more in detail what you remember? And maybe, you know, maybe it, Coach Plaza did any influence uh, to it, or it was just, you know, Spanish basketball league uh, level? I guess there's uh, a little bit of everything. Uh, I know the year before I was, I was playing in Italy and I was playing... 35, 38 minutes a game. And I mean, I scored a lot and I mean, I did different things, but the team wasn't really winning. It wasn't, uh, we wasn't really together to, you know, have a successful season. And then I went to uh, Malaga and we had 12 players, everybody capable of starting, playing big minutes on, on, uh, lower level teams and you you really learn the uh, team concept playing for a team like that and uh learning how to play together and at that at Euro League and ACB level you have to you really have to do that if you want to be successful yeah I remember you loved your time in Malaga uh, yeah. a lot but the next stop was probably even better for you right yes. uh, Valencia can you call Valencia as your like second home I'm not sure. I it, think I think Spain as a whole is, uh-huh. is like I I really like the everything about Spain was was great the the weather obviously the the culture basketball everything uh, I could consider that a second home. What was the best Valencia memory for you? You know when you take when it comes to Valencia the thing the first thing you start to think about. Well, on the court is winning the Spanish, the Spanish league, because uh, the organization, the team has never, had never done that before. And it was and, very unexpected, right? Uh, it, was I it mean, the year done, with we, we Pedro done, Martinez as the head coach? Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, Pedro, yeah. Uh, it was just, uh, I guess, throughout that season, we, it was a, It was a harder season uh-huh. than we we had to do. We lost in the uh, Copa mm-hmm. in the finals to Madrid, and then we lost to Malaga in the Euro Cup final. And we uh, we was up at the end, end, end of game three, and we lost at the end. It was so it was heartbreaking. And then we uh, we continued to work, and then to make it through the playoffs, we beat the the three most historical teams in ACB history. So. To get that championship, it, it was a. Uh, mm, I don't even know the word. It was. It was great. It was a great feeling. What was so special about that team, which you know helped you guys to overcome all these challenges and huge teams? I think just staying together, staying together, and staying focused. We uh, we just believed in each other, and it it turned out well for us. Yeah, you always you already mentioned that you you were that kind of. You know, team player and the, the biggest victory for you is you know team effort and team win and uh, the next thing which uh, you know I figured out about you uh, during my research uh, was that th- these people uh, said that you know Will can be let's say silent uh, in the locker room for like one month uh, but then he can you know speak out about some important things and I remember uh, what was unusual about you I I In, in one game, it was probably in 2018, there was a timeout where you uh, spoke out very loud about selfish uh, play, selfish mm-hmm. game, and it was in Valencia. Yeah. Do you remember that situation, that particular moment, and when you feel that 
you need, you know, to speak out, uh, speak out about some important things. This is always about the team. That's that's how I always uh, carried carried my carried myself. It's about the team. It's never about the individual. And when someone starts putting theirself above the team, you, someone needs to speak up, whether it's the coach or the captain of the team, whoever. They need to speak up about it and tell somebody if they if they start carrying themselves in a way that they're above the team, then you just need to speak up about it. And talking about uh, your current situation, let's say, uh, one of the few mysteries uh, I had was the first thing, uh, why you left Zenit? Uh, because for me, it seemed like, you know, it was a perfect combination, both for you and both for uh, Zenit team. What didn't work out, you know, for you to stay in St. Petersburg? They didn't offer. That's the main thing, right? If you don't offer, I, mm. there's nothing I can do. The next thing was that when you went for uh, to Kazan, uh, Probably it was the first time in your career when you left the team even before the season, not even yeah. during the season, right? What happened, actually? It wasn't the right fit for me. What is not right fit for, for Will Thomas? Mm. <laughs> it just wasn't, it wasn't the right fit for me. I, I've seen it... Uh, I don't know. I, it just wasn't the right fit for me. That's all. Mm. And and I and we decided to part ways, and that was it. Okay, so I see you don't want to be more in <laughs> yeah, detail about that situation. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to. So go fresh too right deep. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's too. It just wasn't the right situation for me at this uh, stage of my career. It wasn't the right situation. In this stage of your career, what you're looking for? Uh, the most? What kind of right situation you're looking uh, for? What kind of expectations you have for yourself? Just the win. I think uh, for me, being around for so long and uh, I might have a, a little bit of a, a shorter fuse for, for the bullshit. Hmm. So I I really just want to win. If uh, if we're winning, everybody's happy. The mood around the team, everything is everything is good. I know we can't win every game, but if we're winning most of the games, it's a fun time. The season goes by easier. Everybody's happy, happy and enjoying the season. What do you think about this Monaco team? What's your first impression about all this? Let's say new team. Many fresh additions. Yeah, it's, it's a very new team. Um, we have to come together very quick if we want to have a, a successful season. Uh, everybody has to play together. We uh, we have to stay healthy, um, stay focused. I know we have a lot of young guys who haven't played at this level, and uh, I can already see now that they're leaning on us. The older guys like me, Mike, uh, Nemo. All of us, because because we have the experience and knowledge of uh, to be successful at this uh, this level. So uh, if everybody just play together, um, follow the coach's lead, uh, believe in the system, uh, we should be do we should be okay. What do you think? What will be the main strength of this team? The main force of Monaco? Hmm. Maybe our youth, you know, young guys, they, uh, if they want to, if they want to learn and, and stay at this level, they'll, they'll take, they'll be sponges and, uh, take all the knowledge in. And, uh, also younger, younger players recover quicker. We're going to play maybe close to 70 games this year. That's a lot. And we need, we need all 15 players to stay healthy, be ready when uh, their number is called. In one of your interviews, you mentioned that Malaga was the best set you had. Did you change your mind after a couple of weeks in, in, in Monaco in this kind of environment? 
Uh, I think they, uh, I think it's uh, kind of similar besides the uh, the cost of living in Monaco. Yeah. Yes. But uh, no, Malaga is still, just because of the cost of living is is better for me. Um, to finish this interview, uh, one of your, let's say, opposing team coaches in NCAA told that, uh, I, I'm not even sure, uh, it was coach Pat Clatchy. No, that's my high school coach. Oh, sorry. Yeah, he yeah was that's your my high school, school coach. Yeah, that's my, that's like my second father almost. Oh, like, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Like, like, yeah, we're that close. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, why he was so important to you? Is there any kind of, you know, story? What would you say about that relationship? Mm, uh, I met him over 20 years ago when uh -huh. I was uh, in middle school. And uh, he recruited me to come to uh, Mount St. Joe High School. And... I mean, it's just a, a great relationship. Mm -hmm. um, my parents still talk to him all the time. I talk to him all the time. And uh, I think he he the one that taught me how to win, how to be a champion. Mm -hmm. So I, the lessons I learned from him, I still take to this day. And uh, he taught me the, uh, the hook shot, the left hand hook shot that I still use today. Mm -hmm. So... That's where I got it from. Yeah, and, and he told that I love it when Will is in our gym. Uh, spring, summer, fall, he plays every game like it's his last. And when your last game will come, I hope, you know, you have many years in your tank. But what will Thomas will do after his last basketball game? I don't know. I'm going to go home and decompress from basketball. <laughs> I think that's the first the first thing I would have to do is uh, decompress because it's been uh, uh, very stressful, very uh, demanding on my body and mind and my family. So that would be the first thing I would do after that. I would see what, what would come to, to me. Before all these uh, good days will come, I just hope I wish you, you know, to take the best out of this experience and out of the best uh, all of all these years yes. remaining. Yes, I, I will. Is uh, I probably won't miss playing basketball, but I'll probably miss the the locker room, oh. things like that, because you don't get that outside of mm -hmm. outside of basketball, the camaraderie with the teammates and. You know, just talking out trash every day and, and doing that type of stuff. That's probably probably the only thing I will miss. Will Thomas, thanks a lot for your time. Thank you for having me.